Aikirti, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hey, Kirti, are uh, you happy to just, uh, just in the interest of time, go first? Uh, okay. We have a few minutes, but yeah, you can share your screen. I didn't include too much of case history. I've just got a few slides with the ones which were pathological lung fields. Sure. Yeah, it looks pretty horrible, but yeah, we'll go through it, yeah. I just was hoping to get some input on whether I've taken it correctly on how I can optimize. And I also went through my settings and I realized the maximum frequency that I have is just eight hertz. And that could be why my preterm babies have a lot of dropout because that's the maximum frequency I have on the linear probe. That's very surprising because the linear probe normally goes up to about 11. So, uh, so are you I, sure? Yeah, because I checked it and it goes only from four to eight. It sounds like that's a sector probe, not a linear probe. No, because it's 9L written over the probe. Okay. So it's 9L. It's, yeah, then it goes, then it should technically go up to nine. But yeah, normally a linear and I wouldn't feel too worried about that. You know, my, my gut feeling is that you'll still be able to get good images. As long as you're using eight and nine, it works. Okay, thank you. We are definitely going to start on time today. Is obviously from our perspective, I would, we're trying to finish our sessions within about 90 minutes, I have 30 minutes of peer review, 45 minutes of discussion where we, we basically get you to interact with cases and then have 15 minutes of kind of questions. Go for it, Kirti, 10 o'clock. So okay. if you go into slideshow mode, yeah. So my first case is a term baby who had congenital pleural effusion, didn't require any support after birth and thereafter he's now a week old and because of some dysmorphic features is also being investigated for Noonan syndrome. This was my ultrasound of the right lateral region. Here, this here is the pleura. The ribs yep. and the pleura, which I think is pleural sliding is present, but I'm not sure if these are subpleural consolidations here. I think these are the comet tails. And this here is the effusion. And if I'm not wrong, is this the jellyfish sign, which they say? Yeah. So this is the, it's, it's the jellyfish sign. So you can basically see the distal end of uh, the lung floating in pleural fluid which looks relatively clear, I'd say, you know, uh, I, I'm not, not sure that there's much in terms of fibrin moving in it. Uh, because you're using a low frequency probe, mm -hmm. your pleura looks a little bit on the irregular side. My gut feeling is if you were to use a higher frequency, what's the gestation in this baby? Term baby. This is it's a, a term baby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You might get a slightly more regular pleura, but that's okay. Yes, you have comet tails over there. Uh, you've got a beeline coming in over here. And really what you've got over here, uh, so if you take your arrow and mm -hmm. move to the extreme left of your screen. Left, I have yep. one. Yep. So if you, if you go to the image, go to the image, just go down, go down, further down. So there, there's a line that goes all the way down. That's a B line. Okay, that's a very nice discrete B line. And below that B line, what do you think this is? There's a big white patch over there. I thought this was just artifact. I don't know. So I, th I think if your image was more crisp, you probably, because you have lung that's collapsed within the pleural fluid, that might reflect a consolidation. Okay. But clearly what 
I can see his very nice plural sliding with a very nice jellyfish sign. So you see the lung basically, it, the way I like to describe it is it's like somebody's sticking their tongue out at you and coming back and in. So that's the classical jellyfish sign. But what you don't see is the plankton sign, which is kind of debris within uh, the, the plural fluid. Okay. And then you see, what else do you see? Would you like to describe other things below the lung? So this here is the diaphragm and this here is the liver. Okay, very nice. So you have the diaphragm and anything below the diaphragm? Is is this what you're referring to? Correct. Is that fluid or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's basically uh, fluid in the uh, subdiaphragmatic space just above the level of the liver. And uh, okay. if, if, you know, that can mm -hmm. indicate an ascites, uh, but it can also indicate a collection. And if, if it's big enough, often what happens is the liver moves down into the center of the abdomen. You get what is called a floating liver sign, but that's for later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, very nice. So you've, you've definitely got a pleural effusion in the right anterior zone. Okay. What else would you like to describe the image on the right? So on the right, this is, sorry, I've marked RA. This is actually right posterior. Yeah. So these here are the ribs. This is the fluid between the parietal and the visceral pleura. Yeah. Then I think this would form the quad sign if you draw two parallel lines. Completely. And Very these, nice. These, I, I'm not sure whether to call them rockets or just bee lines because they seem to be going back and forth across yep. the screen. So standard terminology, uh, most... Adults call them rockets. We call them beelines. Basically, what I'd say is they are beelines. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, they go all the way down. And the reason you see them is because your lung is obviously collapsed. So is wet. Uh, how many hours old is the baby? This baby is now one week old. Okay. So you have pretty wet lungs still. Okay. So, yep. He's in room air. No distress. Nothing. Yep. So somehow. Okay, amazing. Uh, this was, you, um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so just going back to that image. So what do you think about sliding? I don't think we can comment on sliding because we've got space between pleura, visceral and parietal pleura. Very good. That's, that's a really important point. So this is the point that I want to make to all of you, that once you get air or fluid, within the visceral and parietal pleura, you shouldn't really be commenting on sliding. And that kind of concept that you can see beelines that are moving, uh, you know, so the reason they're actually moving at this particular point is, uh, why, why, can I ask anybody in the group? So uh, anybody want to comment on why they come and go? It's like a breathing. Yeah, very good. So inspiration, expiration. So really what I do is I try, you've got four centimeters here. Your lung basically has a B profile with B lines that extend all the way down, but whatever lung aeration is taking place is causing the B lines to disappear. So as you can see in that situation, you know, uh, the lungs a little bit better aerated. So this is not sliding because the pleura is actually separated from visceral from the parietal pleura. So very good. Yeah. It's a very nice image. And again, I just, you know, for everybody in the group, what I'd like to say to you at this particular point is what you can see is that even with using a low frequency probe, you can actually get good enough images. And what I'd say to you again, for plural effusions in term babies, I would, I would use a frequency of about eight or nine. It gives you very good images in terms of the, the hypoequic shadow of the fluid. And in particular, uh, you know, unlike uh, the, the linear probe, which is a quite a long probe, when you want to define, especially the largest pocket, you know, I, I find using the curvy linear probe much better, which is kind of what we use for head scans. Uh, and going forwards, when I when we talk about plural effusions in a few weeks and how we tap them, diagnostic paracentesis, I will show you exactly how to identify the widest pocket for paracentesis. It's really useful, and the reason for that is. Traditionally, when we do paracentesis in babies with pleural effusion, we have restricted ourselves. And the reason we've restricted ourselves is like, if you go on the right side, we all like to use the triangle of safety. And if you look at the triangle of safety, really, it's the third to fifth space. Now you'd go in posterior axillary line for fluid. 
maybe mid-axillary line if you had a hydronomothorax. But really what I'd say is that when you have decent pleural effusions, especially on the right side, tapping lower might be of greater benefit. But the biggest fear you have once you start going below the fifth space is the risk of hitting the liver. And again, this is where I would say that if you have an ultrasound probe and you can actually quantify the pocket, you can actually see your needle going in. You can aspirate fluid with it. And as you're aspirating fluid, what you can see, so uh, Kirti, if you can just put your, your cursor on the, on the visceral pleura. Yeah. So the visceral pleura, yeah. So if you assume that Kirti's blue arrows are the needles, so really what you can see as you absorb is the visceral pleura come into contact with the parietal pleura. And the benefit of that is a lot of us use butterflies to try and aspirate fluid. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say that there's a big risk in using a butterfly needle because as the visceral pleura, if you're doing this as a blind procedure, comes close to the parietal pleura, uh, what happens is eventually the needle punctures the lung. And often when you are trying to drain fluid, you end up creating what is called a hydronomothorax. And that's the argument that a lot of people have is that actually... Rather than actually tap, uh, you know, the question is whether you go for a pigtail, which means that you're less likely to actually damage the lung because you've got a fluid pocket protecting you. Whereas in hydrops babies, if you decide to tap all the fluid and then put a drain in, you have much less fluid and there's just a higher risk then of damaging the lung. The beauty of using ultrasound is you can actually do this under direct vision. Uh, you can see once the, you know, the, the, the visceral pleura is coming close to your needle, you stop. So it, it's very, very, very useful uh, when you're trying to tap fluid. Carry on, carry on, Kirti. So the next one I did was to look at the sinusoidal sign on M. Very nice, beautiful. And shouldn't it be very black here? Because I don't know why I've got this white here. Should, should it not be black? It should be, uh, I but... Again, what you've got is you do have a little bit of movement between the parietal and the visceral pleura. Now, eventually, mm -hmm. it's that shimmering effect that you get. So, mm -hmm. I mean, your collection is about a centimeter. You know, if you look at it, it's not massive at this particular point. And when I look at your next slide, it's it's barely there. So, the, mm -hmm. the larger the effusion, the, okay. the more dark yeah. you'll find the image because the varietal and you know, visceral mm -hmm. pleura will not be moving much on top of each other. So in terms of reflection of sound waves, you're mm -hmm. still getting a little bit of a shimmering effect where you get that dark area. Okay. But it's a beautiful sinusoidal sign. I, I wouldn't be able to get this better myself. But again, really nice depth. And again, the beauty of using, uh, you know, a probe that's just uh, frequency of eight. Well done. Very good. Thank you. And let's say just a for comparison on the left posterior side where there was no effusion. There's the plural with sliding sign. I think these are the subplural consolidation and compact free lines. Okay, so yes, you may be right uh, and you're doing the scan. Uh, what I'd say is that is where the benefit of using a higher frequency probe and uh, you're using a GE machine, are you? Or yeah. a sonocyte? A GE, so, so it, yeah, a GE. You're using a sonocyte. So again, the G and the sonocyte don't tend to have a focus button. Mm. The reason for that is they, and you could see the, the image is nice and uniform throughout in the left posterior region. You've got minimal pleural effusion there. You know, you can just see a, a, a small dark area there where the visceral and parietal pleura are separated. But again, what you've got is very good sliding. Now, the only reason I say a high frequency probe would be better is because what I don't know is whether these are compact B lines. And if you used a high frequency probe, what you might find is rather than being subplural consolidations, they extend all the way to the bottom. So my, my gut feeling is I think if you used a higher frequency probe, you'd find that these are actually compact B lines and that this lung basically has a lot of interstitial edema in it. But again, how does that alter your interpretation? I mean, when you make an interpretation at this particular point, you're going to clinically correlate. So what's the gestation of your baby? This is a term baby who doesn't have any clinical distress. Yep. It's basically congenitally di antenatally diagnosed. So we did an x-ray postnatally. And because there's dysmorphism, he's being looked up for a syndromic cause, but he's okay. No, this is crucial. And the reason I say this is crucial, if somebody comes and tells me, well, this is a 24-weeker, mm -hmm. I immediately start kind of thinking elsewhere. But now you said this is a term baby with no respiratory distress. Hence my kind of thinking 
that actually if I used a higher frequency probe, my gut feeling is what you just get is interstitial fluid there, which is probably likely to reflect fluid in the interlobular and intralobular spaces, as opposed to these being subplural consolidations, which would go more with RDS. So, but you know, that's that's the beauty of lung ultrasound. You just like you clinically correlate, you clinically correlate on ultrasound as well. Very good. Please carry on. And this was just a quick one. This is a preterm baby who had pulmonary mm -hmm. hemorrhage on day two. And now he is day eight on mechanical ventilator. This is the right posterior region, which yeah. had a broken pleura, subpleural consolidation. And I had also done a Doppler to see if there was any vascularity. Yeah, there's no vascularity. So there was none. And I thought at this point, this might be more of atelectasis than consolidation. But then two weeks later, or not two weeks later, at two weeks of age, about day 17, this was the picture for the same baby in the same area with thickened, irregular, broken pleura, compact V profile, shred sign with, I think these are the static bronchograms or dynamic, yeah. I'm not sure. Okay, static. Static, I, I don't think they're dynamic because they're not, you know, maybe with the eye of faith, you have the odd one that's disappearing and coming yeah, up, but they're not moving in and out. So my gut feeling is they're already within that area and you've got a beautiful shred sign, not good for the baby. So mm -hmm. the pleura is completely destroyed with an irregular kind of fractal margin. Uh, again, lots of subpleural consolidations there. I think what I'd like to highlight to everybody at this particular point is that you've got good depth at four centimeters. I can still see the deeper tissue which again is very useful at this particular point. So that's that's really helpful. Uh, can we go back to your previous slide? Yeah. So how many days after pulmonary hemorrhage is that? So this baby had hemorrhage on day two and I did this on day eight. So four yeah. days, four days, oh, okay. six days later. So, I mean, what what kind of a profile would you describe this as, Kirti? C profile. Yeah, very good. C profile. Uh, and, you know, if you look at lung sliding, it's virtually absent. Is Can I ask? Are, are you pulse? Is that the lung pulse? Yeah, that's lung pulse on the right side where your arrow is. Can you just go back again? And again, it's to say that people sometimes just misconstrue and think that lung pulse is only seen on the left side with the heart. It's not. You can see it on the right side as well. And especially when you have a collapse consolidation on the right side, in, you know, adjacent to the heart, you know, if I, if I look at the right lower lobe of the lung and when it's collapsed, the heart actually gets pulled towards collapse, as you know, and that actually gives you a lung pulse. Uh, this is right anterior uh, upper. Now, uh, just there is a grading for subplural consolidation. And when you look at the grading and we'll talk about that, and I'm 100% sure that Dr. Almirina will talk about that, but this is basically, it's nearly grade three. Uh, grade four is is horrible, completely destroyed with atelectasis, but this is grade three, as you can see. So massive subpleural consolidations, pleura that's broken. And as you come distally, so just below, so if you take your arrow, we're taking the image on the left side, okay? Just move to your left, move, move, yeah, stop there, stop, yeah, you just go back to where you were, a little bit more, a little bit more, now go up. Now there's a small dense white area in between. That's Can you see that? Yeah. So that's consolidation. It it mm -hmm. could be atelectasis. It could be consolidation. And we'll talk a lot about this on uh, when we do pneumonia, collapse consolidation, how we differentiate them. Now, few features that kind of tell me this is a consolidation versus a kind of a, a kind of an atelectasis at this particular point is uh, that. You, you do have some bright areas within it. It moves and it expands and collapses at this particular point. So there must be some air going in and out of it. Uh, what you've also got is you've got some static air bronchograms. Would you like to point them out Are in these... that image? No, that's, that's again, that's just, I think, lung. That's, can you see the bright areas? Can you see the bright, the pinpoint bright areas? So just remember, air bronchograms are always bright. Can you see the areas that look more bright? That, that is a static air bronchogram. Okay. And you have a little shred sign. So just, yes, yeah, just over there. So a very regular shred sign. And this is very classical. What has happened is you've had a significant pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, you, you have 
lung inflammation secondary to that with the pleura being destroyed. But what you've really nicely shown is that this is consolidation. There's very little vascularity to it. There's a little bit of vascularity to it, but you know, no blood vessels like uh, Abhijit described in his talk. And then if you go to the next slide. So yeah, that's why if, when I took a few days later and there was vascularity, I thought maybe it's developing into an infection because blood is a good medium, but I don't know. No CRP rise? So far, it's been stable at 10, 9.88. Okay. I mean, what I'd say is that it's it's a very small area. Mm. And again, you have to see how it evolves. Uh, you, and vascularity may be increased because that area is obviously broken down and it needs to heal. Mm. But yeah, I think if you said the CRP was elevated, mm. again, uh, I'd, I'd clinically be a little bit worried about a possible infective process. Okay. That's great. You have some compact B lines coming through, uh, especially mm. behind the so, you know, again, it's to say that you can have compact B lines under the area of kind of uh, significant breakdown, atelectasis. So do you have any other slides? No, no, thank you. Okay. Very nice. Very good images. Can I ask anybody with any questions, please? Okay, great. So uh, I, uh, we've got Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed, are you happy to share your screen? Um, sorry, sorry. Look, I had a technical issue, so I couldn't. No problem. That's not a problem at all. So uh, we've got Sharif. Uh, Dr. Sharif, would you be able to share your screen? Uh, yes. Uh... Can you see it now? Yes, very nice. Thank you. It's very kind of you. I'm really grateful. Okay, so uh, this is a 34 weeks uh, baby, uh, birth weight I, around two kilos. Do you want to go into slideshow mode? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. So 34 weeks baby, uh, around two kilos of weight, uh, born by emergency caesarean section because of fetal bradycardia, received steroids uh, just six hours before delivery. Uh, there was no risk factors for infection, required CPAP uh, after the delivery uh, with um, a PEEP of around 5 and FI to reach it up to 70%. And the baby was uh, taken to the neonatal unit for escalation of care. Uh, when the baby reached to the neonatal unit, uh, the oxygen requirement has come down to 35%, but the baby remained tachypneic uh, with mild subcostal recessions. Um, X-ray done. Um, uh, actually, that so. X-ray. This is the X-ray of the baby. You can see it. Showed uh, ground glass appearance and air bronchogram. Um, and the ultrasound was done. So I'm not sure why R1 is frozen here, but. Um, um, I'll just go to R2. So from the, what I can see is that I can see um, compact B lines and uh, the pleura is slightly irregular, sliding, continuous. I can see a mixed AB profile in this view. Uh, then R3, uh, there is um, better irrigation. Sorry, I'm not yep. sure again why it's not moving as it was. Sorry. So, so what I'd suggest, uh, Dr. Sharif, is uh, I'll show you today in my PowerPoint. So when you click on the images, the videos, you can go into playback. And playback will let you let the videos play in auto. But I'll show everybody how to do that today. Yeah. Okay, fine. No problems. I, I think what is visible, you know, it shows definitely some A lines. Some A lines could see yeah. here the pleura yeah. is uh, regular. Yeah. Uh, and that's Beautiful. another picture, yeah, which showed yeah. The nearly yeah. normal lungs with yeah. some common detail here. Yeah. But generally, that's A profile. Completely, lungs are completely fine from this view. Yeah. And then I went to the left side. The pleura yep. here is uh, slightly irregular um, with common B tails, but also I could appreciate some compact B lines uh, with A lines. So it was A, B profile. Um, and 
here as well. I, I don't believe this is consolidation, but uh, I can't see any consolidations, but it's AB profile. Um, and then this is the A2. In the A2, I found difficulty uh, from the heart yeah. but I could appreciate here some of the compact B lines and A lines as well. So it was A and B profile. Yep. Be seen. I think it's a I good attempt. I think it's a very good attempt, Dr. Sharif, to try and get the heart out of the way. So my compliments. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, then on the L3 view, I could see mainly compact B line. So I did the uh, breadth score here and uh, it came as six. Uh, next day, I, when I came, um, and that's so, again. Dr. Dr. Sharif, what we'll do is we'll just have a look at these images first. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. So if we just go back into slideshow mode. So can I just ask which probe are you using? The, the linear probe. And what frequency are you using? Um, it was at eight. It's a frequency of eight on the linear probe. And do you yes. have a higher frequency on it? Uh, yes. Okay. My advice would be, I, I I would use a higher frequency. What's the highest frequency you have? Um, I think it is around uh, uh, 16 or oh, Okay, 14. that's, yeah. Okay, what I'd probably say is uh, go to your highest frequency, bring it down until you've got a uniform appearance from one to five. And my gut feeling is you probably settle around 12, but because you're using such a low frequency, what is happening is that the the superficial part of the lung at this particular point of the deep part is is kind of it's it's visible but uh, my gut feeling is you're not getting as good or images as you might get if you used a slightly higher frequency and your gain settings uh, so so what i would say is that as far as possible guys what we want to do when you're trying to and this is obviously we're starting our second month now is when you save your images, and I'll show you in my images today, you can actually save the settings of your frequency on, on, on the image uh, without having patient identifiable details and that kind of, because my gut feeling is your gain could go up. And I think if your gain went up, what you would see is you would see B profiles and A lines much better. So a little bit of a higher gain. Uh, if you know what you're doing, I'd, I'd probably say that, you know, a gain of anywhere between 67 and 80, we call it C-dynamic on the GE. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to go up on that. And my only other comment is just, uh, is that your focus on the right-hand side? Do you have your focus? I mean, do you adjust focus in your machine or what is what is the machine? Is it a solar side? GE, no, GE machine. Yeah, so a GE should not need focus. But my gut feeling is just mm -hmm. higher frequency and increased gain settings. And let's see what you, when you do your, your next scan, what it's okay. like. Yeah. Fine. But I think your interpretation is absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, right. So I just want to go to the other one. So that was yep. maybe 24 hours back. Uh, uh, sorry, 24 hours after. Yep. So the reason we repeated the scan because oxygen requirements went up. And, and there was more work of breathing um, uh, and the baby remained on high flow. Yep. So by the time I repeated the uh, ultrasound, uh, I, I didn't repeat the X-ray, I just repeated the ultrasound. Well done, yep. And And my interpretation here is that I, I can't see the A lines that I saw initially, so I could see so, more. Sorry, Dr. Sharif, uh, you're not in slideshow mode. So I, I think, okay, let me try again. And you, your PowerPoint is frozen, so. Okay, can you can you see it now? Uh, is, guys, is that the case for everybody or is it just me? So you, uh, shall I close it and open it? Yeah, again? yeah. So you might want to just, yeah. Stop share and reshare. Okay. 
Uh, can you see now? Guys, can somebody else stop comment? Share. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I stopped yeah. sharing again. Yeah. I'll try again. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, fine. So I, after 24 hours, I repeat it again. And uh, I, from this view, I can um, see, I can't see A lines as I uh, did see 24 hours before. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, um, the, there was a uh, white out, like, uh, sorry, I could see some compact B lines here. Yep. Uh, and then I did the M mode. M -mode. I found the seashore appearance. Yep, beautiful. Um, and then from the lateral side on the right, I compact could see B compact B lines. Uh, with acoustic shadows between. So I can't see any A lines that I saw before. Um, here also on the left side, um, I, again, from sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult from the cardiac shadow, but I couldn't see any A lines here as well. The pelura is slightly thick and sliding. And I went to L2. Again, I can see compact B lines. Yeah. No A lines at all. And L3, uh, if you remember that right. view, it, it was showing like a, a mainly A profile. Now it's it's B profile. So the score here was 11. The good thing about that, we gave a surfactant uh, and the baby improved over the next 12 hours in terms of work of breathing and oxygenation. So it was very good not to depend on the X-ray and depend on the clinically and the ultrasound images. What was the gestation of your baby? 34 Sorry. weeks. 34 weeks. Okay. Uh, yeah, but mom, mom is diabetic. Uh, was sure, sure. I think that's a very relevant point of the history. Yeah. So, yeah. So, again, my only comment at this particular point is because of the frequency, I just wonder whether we might not be interpreting subplural consolidations as well as we should be. So, again, my, my advice would be really important. Play with your probe. And like yesterday, me and uh, one of my colleagues at the Cornish who's learning, we, we had a nice play with the probe where we discussed and talked about image optimization. So what I'd say is don't hesitate to use your linear probe. Start with the highest frequency and look at what really your image quality uh, looks like. But my gut feeling is you gain settings also have to go up. But well done. Sure. Thank you. Shall I stop sharing? Uh, that's really kind. Uh, we've got time for one more. Does anybody want to share anyone? We've got. That's fine. You can stop sharing. I will share. That's really kind. Thank you, Dr. Shreef. So guys, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do a little bit of revision today. Uh, and uh, clearly from my perspective, we've just got a, a, a kind of a workshop again. Uh, it, this is going to be interactive. So if any of you guys want to turn your screens on, it's kind of nice to be able to see some faces. But if you don't want to and you're not in that predisposition, that's absolutely fine. But I think what I am going to emphasize over the next few kind of sessions is that <clears throat> your clinical interpretation of a lung ultrasound scan really depends on the clinical presentation. Now, the clinical presentation from our perspective could be a similar set of symptoms and signs, but appearing at different timelines. And really based on that clinical presentation and that timeline, and when you do your lung ultrasound, uh, you will have findings which you will have to interpret. So again, uh, the concept that I am trying to espouse is what I would call is mental modeling. So it's thinking about your clinical history, clinical presentation, and a standardized approach. 
Now, in both these conditions, uh, if you had a baby with respiratory distress and low saturations, you might have differentials which are quite similar. But clearly, a baby uh, presenting at birth with respiratory distress versus a baby who was completely well at birth, who needed uh, no resuscitation, and is suddenly found to be acutely distressed, you know, might have a differential that you want to put right at the top. And a pneumothorax would stand out in this situation. Whereas for a baby who has a little bit of respiratory distress after birth with mild recession, which is continuing to get better, there are a lot of differentials that come above that. And that's where I would say that how you perform your lung ultrasound is quite crucial. Because clearly, unless you follow a standardized protocol for this purpose, you're kind of going to have a, a, a situation where you really risk missing things. And uh, in particular, I think if you had, and you were trying to diagnose, say, a pneumonia because you have a history of PROM in a baby who has respiratory distress right from birth, and you don't do the posterior regions, the flaps point in particular, then there's a real risk that you might miss a posterior consolidation, you know, establish pneumonia with shred sign. I've seen it at birth. And uh, that usually means that you've had long-standing lung illness. Uh, so again, what I would say is that your lung protocol and how you perform your lung ultrasound will actually be governed by this, but also the stability of the baby. So if you have a baby who's acutely deteriorating at two hours of age, who you know is rapidly desaturating at 100% and starting to become bradycardic, I would argue that actually the time taken to put a probe on this baby, connect your ultrasound, switch it on, is gonna be very time consuming. So be very careful. So I think for a pneumothorax, a clinical diagnosis, you know, in particular for attention pneumothorax is much quicker if it's done. And uh, I think, you know, translumination, clinical uh, kind of correlation, and then needling is the way forwards. And the reason I, I'm, I'm presenting this is going forwards, Dr. Yusuf uh, Nadia will present the safer protocol, which is kind of the use of ultrasound in, in the crashing neonate. Now, when we talk about the crashing neonate, can I just say that ultrasound, uh, while you're doing resuscitation, if you're doing CPR, can actually interfere with resuscitation and you do not want to do that. So just be very, very careful about how we define the crashing neonate in those circumstances. Uh, just going forwards, I think what I said is stick to a standardized approach. You know, what is the history? What's the antenatal kind of findings? What is your mode of delivery? Is there, are there risk factors for sepsis? And eventually what clinical course the baby's taking. But these are the common differentials. Now, my expectation, and this is really important, is that at the end of two months, I think the identification of RDS and differentiation from transient tachypnea should kind of be something that you can do quite easily. I would say that the diagnosis of pneumonia and meconium aspiration, again, is not difficult, but needs clinical correlation of a high degree. You know, the presence of meconium, rising CRPs, a febrile kind of, uh, you know, syndemonic effusions with kind of evidence of uh, fibrin or exudate in the, in the pleural effusion. Pneumothorax is something that I would say at the moment, I, I'm, I think uh, will take time. You know, some of you will, will probably see a pneumothorax maybe after the course is actually over. And uh, I wouldn't feel too worried about it. But what I would say is that once you've seen it, you'll never forget it. And it's very, very easy diagnosis to make, as we've seen just in the last 48 hours in my unit. The less common things I'm not going to talk about at this particular point, but what I would like you to follow is a standardized approach, please. So think about what you're seeing and describe it. And when you're describing it, I want you to start at the level of the plura. I want you to describe the plura. I want you to describe sliding. I would then like you to describe whether you can see subplural consolidations or consolidations and think about your profile. Uh, in addition to that, once you've done that for each lung field that you're seeing, anterior, upper, lower, lateral, upper, lower, posterior, upper, lower, you need to think of doing M mode. And in particular, reporting your M mode and looking very carefully to make sure that you are not missing any consolidations in those particular regions. But based on that, if we look at these, these differentials that we're going to go through over the next three sessions, RDS, so a B profile, predominantly, but subplural consolidations, really important. You can have that with varying degrees of 
I would say wetness. So, you know, you can have B lines uh, more than three to five per space, mild, no AIS, no white lung. So maybe a baby who's 32 weeks, who's basically got mild RDS, which is getting better. Uh, in the improving phase, you can have spared areas, which you sometimes see with transient tachypnea. Uh, the double lung point can also be seen in RDS. It's not just specific to transient tachypnea of newborn. But what is obviously uh, very important is the pleural line is always abnormal. Subpleural consolidations will always be there. And in particular, the differentiating feature from transient tachypnea of newborn is, is the fact that it is homogeneous diffuse disease. There are fewer spared areas. Uh, unless you've given the baby surfactant, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, the appearance of a double lung point with a sharp, relatively regular pleura would favor TTN. And again, clinically correlating, you know, this baby should gradually get better with time. Pneumonia, we'll talk about, but today we are going to talk a little bit about two pathologies, which are pneumothorax and meconium aspiration. So without further Ado, let's go to some cases. We've done these last time. So we have a baby and let's identify uh, who are we going to ask today? So we've got 16 participants. Okay, last time we had Zaradine and uh, I think we had Anna. Didia, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So, DDA, I'm going to give you a partner in crime. So, uh, Suman, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent. Okay. So, Suman, DDA, you, you're going to help each other. But we're looking at the uh, uh, clinical course of a preterm 36 week baby. And at this particular point, this baby was uh, delivered through PROM and GBS. Uh, the mode of delivery was a normal vaginal delivery. Uh, the baby had uh, a little bit of peep at birth, but no significant resuscitation. Uh, and at two hours of age, when the postnatal ward uh, doctor went to review the baby, he felt the baby was grunting quite significantly. So admitted the baby and uh, has taken him to the neonatal unit and the baby's currently on CPAP. You want any more information? Yes. Is the baby on um, fever? Sorry, is the baby? Uh, has a fever? No, the baby does not have any temperature. We've done a screen. We've started antibiotics, but no temperature. Uh, the baby's relatively alert, uh, you know, but working quite hard. So, you know, has recession, has a respiratory rate of about 60 uh, we've just done a blood gas, and the blood gas isn't too bad, actually. The pH is 7.3, and the CO2 is about uh, 8 kilopascals, or the equivalent of about 56 millimeters. So mild kind of a respiratory acidosis, a little bit. Okay. Okay. So Did these the days... Any fever? No, no history of maternal fever. And mode of delivery? So the mode of delivery was a normal delivery. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we're just gonna, so these are the images. So this is R1. So would, uh, Suman, would you like to comment on R1? Is it the left uh, top one? No, this is right apical, R1. So right no, no, upper. I mean, there are four uh, clips. Yeah, so there are four clips and they're basically different aspects of R1 at this particular point okay. in different areas. So that's the okay. top portion. So the reason uh, I've taken these four clips is because I'm using a hockey stick. And as you can see, the hockey stick is barely giving me about three ribs at this particular yeah. point. So I've kind of, you can say that this is R1 right upper, mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. right middle, and this is actually also right middle. Uh, there's a slight difference, and there's a reason why I'm showing you these two. I can't see your cursor. 
When you say right okay. middle. Yeah. Okay. So let me show you my cursor. So this is the right upper. Okay. Okay. These right. two are both right middle. All right. Okay. So in the right upper, we can see uh, pleura regular and sliding well. Um, nicely uh, shown uh, three spaces. Uh, and uh, here okay, are so eight, well, eight well done. Well done. So first of all, you're absolutely right. So we can see the batwing sign. So we can see intercostal right. spaces. You can see pleura. Uh, well, you, so you're happy the plural is sliding? Right. Okay, excellent. And uh, you can see A lines. Right. And there are some compact B lines also. Which image? The same one. Uh, I think in the middle space, uh, it's showing somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's great. Beautiful. Uh, Didier, what do you think? Well, I see a, a good plural sliding. And uh, I see the, the pattern is like an A profile, predominantly. Uh, few B lines. I, I don't really appreciate B lines in the first clip. And uh, I think it's, it's a, a normal uh, ultrasound at this point. Okay, excellent. Okay, that's beautiful. Well done, guys. Uh, does anybody else want to comment? I'm just curious. Let's invite the group as well. There's I'll a drop up. sign. Sorry? Go for it, Kirti. I think there is a drop sign because all these ribs are getting reflected down. Mm. Okay, so a few things. There's just a little bit of a worry that you've kind of got these uh, ribs mirror imaging, so possibly a truck sign. And... Uh, what, uh, Anna, what do you think? I'm curious. I'm not sure in the first uh, scan if lung sliding is so well apparent. Okay. Okay. So Fair I think point. you did the M mode because of that, maybe. Yep. Uh, okay. Fair point. So really, uh, we've got some some people. What, so Sorry, can we, I? Yeah. Can I say something? It. Also, I because uh, I can see some common B tails. Um, so that is, uh, as I understand the signs, that the pleura is sliding, which will not be there in case of uh, pneumothorax. Okay. So now we've got the group going. This is beautiful. This is why I love showing this case. Okay. So we've got a few people. Uh, so we've got uh, kind of uh, Zaradin clearly alluding to the fact, and I'm going to use my cursor so that you guys can see. So, sorry about that. So clearly for me at this particular point, I do think there's an element of sliding there. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now what I do worry about is this region here. Uh, we've got an A profile. I think you have some comet tails there. I'm not convinced that what you're seeing here are comet tails and I do really worry, but actually you're right. There is a mirror image and there's a truck sign here. So there are a few, it's a confusing kind of a clinical picture. So what did I say we should do when we have a confusing clinical picture? M mode? M mode. Yes. Okay, so what do we think about the M mode? Yeah, I'll look sure, uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. At, uh, uh, in the rightmost part, sorry, the leftmost part of this image, that, that there is a, this pleura seems to have broken. Um, uh, over and, here? Yes. Uh, okay, I want you to forget these images. Forget the lower images. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about the lower images, the mid-zone later. No, 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 I'm not but, talking about the lower images. Yeah. This is the same R1 top yeah. image. Yeah. Uh, at the left, left extreme. Here. Yeah. There are sub, sub, sub consolidations. Yeah, you're right. There might be a small consolidation over there. Again, and what I do is, so my, my advice would be that I haven't got the alignment as well. And I'd probably mm -hmm. go higher up to try and see that in, in more clarity. But yeah, you're right. That could be a consolidation. But for me, I, I want us to focus on, uh, are we absolutely certain that when you look at this, 
kind of uh, M mode. So what do we think? So Anna thinks this is seashore sign. What do the others think? I'm not too sure if this uh, is seashore. I think or... it's seashore as well. Okay, what about here? Okay, so, so we got a little bit of confusion there. Okay, so what I'd say to you is that actually, I haven't unfortunately been able to save the, the, the moving image of this, but there is a seashore with a barcode coming in and we'll be able to, when we see the next few cases, be able to delineate that. There is a small anterior pneumothorax. So, and this is what I want to kind of mention to you that it is, and very, very small air bubbles and air pockets can actually present like this and be very confusing. And really what I would say is your mental modeling is very important in those circumstances. So uh, on X-ray, we had a very small air leak uh, anterior collection. Now, what I'd like us to do is uh, the mid-zone images. So there's a reason why I'm showing you these mid-zone images. So can I, can I get, uh, who else is there? So had Sharif, Diria, so let's, uh, Dr. Vetrevel, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vetrevel, would you like to comment on the, the, the mid-zone images of the right side? Yeah. So they're both the same, the, exactly the same field. But yeah. uh, there's a, why do you think I'm showing these two images? Um, the the plural, I feel it is a little bit... Uh, Thickened, and I can see some. Uh, whether this one is any, um, the sliding is better in the right side. The where you are, the you know. Okay, so you can see a batwing sign. <laughs> you can yes. see plura, and the plura looks yes. irregular. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it also, if you look at how blurred the appearance is, if you look at the gain yes. settings, so yeah. really, again, it's just to highlight to you that at this particular point, I'm actually using, uh, you know, a probe with a frequency that's not high enough. And all I've done at this particular point here is I have increased the frequency of the probe. So I've, I've actually gone up from using eight to about, I think, 10 or 11 over here. And if you look at the quality of the image, and this is the reason for showing it to you, is actually when you compare both these images, the plura becomes regular. Again, yeah. you have regular sliding over here. And then I just yes. want to make the point, the truck sign on its own and seeing acoustic shadowing of the ribs. So yeah. Yeah. You, you just have to be a little bit careful that if, if the plura is sliding, truck sign on its own does not actually mean you have an omothorax. Okay. Because clearly you can see plural sliding over here. You can yes. see comet tails and you can see what is uh, basically an A profile. So lung that is actually pretty decent, but you can see how frequency alters our interpretation. And this is why I would say it's really important that you play with your probes to try and optimize. The only other thing on this, I mean, this is a Philips that I'm using. And on the Philips, there's, uh, there's a mode which we call sharp mode. And actually it just makes your images a little bit more crisp. So, you know, if you have sharp mode on your images, but you can see the subtleties, such a small pneumothorax, you move from the, the right upper to the, the kind of middle zone. Yeah. And actually, you know, you get good plural sliding at this particular point. Any questions yes. by anybody? I, I just have a quick reflection on this, if I may. Sorry? I have a quick reflection on this, if I may. Please, 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 by all means. Um, it's really just to make myself feel uh, better. Yeah. So uh, I felt initially bad for missing this, but uh, then I said to myself, and I'm happy to share this with um, the group, is that that's if the uh, pneumothorax is too small for me to, uh, or sm small enough to miss or to reach a consensus about it, then that's fine because it's likely not to be acted upon clinically. Completely agree. And what I'd say is that, Really, in this baby, my 
my reflection and let's let's have a look at the next set of images but any other questions yeah. yes I, i also have a doubt where yes, this please. Is actually okay so when you look at this image at this particular point as you move lower down you can see this plural sliding over here okay but really when you look at this plural over here there's no plural sliding okay, okay. no no plural sliding at this particular point what what you might be thinking is that these are comet tails they're not they're not comet tails uh, and that's where you have to be careful this baby is breathing in and out and actually this movement that you're seeing again is just basically it's it's aeration of the lung and really what i would say to you is that is what i would say is a small pocket of air but when you look at this this is the sa- this is the basically the seashore sign but there are intermittent areas of what look like a barcode sign as well and really if i was playing this you'd be able to see this much better but okay. i've got a few more cases let's go through them and it'll it'll become more obvious to you okay but for me let's look at the left side Uh so who wants to have a go at this I want to do that uh, I look that's okay Go for it yeah go for it Okay so first first um, uh, image um two, three, four four um uh sorry four ribs yep and uh, three intercostal spaces um the plural line it seems to be uh, straight not interrupted then regular yep and i think they're sliding um comet tails and there's uh, mainly a, a profile very good yeah yeah three three p lines uh, which we are not taking to think yeah and sure so for me this is a normal uh, lung ultrasound yep i would completely agree with that uh, yep it's do you want to criticize it a little bit so do you want yes. to criticize so I'd you be could, very happy yeah you don't see uh, first the dips to only three i would go to four maybe beautiful um, yeah and then uh, you don't see the b lines to the end so maybe here i will decrease the frequency or okay case. yep so what i'd say is that uh, really you can see and if you want more depth at this particular point then your frequency would have to change you're absolutely right okay. uh, what about l2 okay so l2 again um the sliding is normal you see more um uh, b line in the right side of the uh, of the image yep um may, mostly uh, a profile yep uh, and again is a, a normal ultrasound uh, image yep yep you you're right i i would agree maybe a few b lines that are coming in on that yes. right mm-hmm. side over here and the reason why they're not so obvious because you can actually see them come over here is because i'm using a high frequency and you probably need a lower frequency to actually see more depth so slower frequency yeah yeah and you know on this image what you can see is what looks like probably a b profile mm-hmm. uh, a lung profile where you have a lung point so a profile over here mm-hmm. and this area you know it's it's pretty dense b lines so mm-hmm. lung might lung be point. a double yeah a double yeah. lung point at this particular point so wh- what do we so, think the um, yeah yeah sorry the upper two spaces they are showing bamboo sign sign i guess yeah yeah absolutely these are bamboo signs classical especially this area here is a very nice bamboo sign we we'll show you a very nice bamboo sign soon soon but here i'd say you know these are coalies b lines going all the way down again what i'm trying to give you is the importance of frequency and really mm-hmm. depth really to get your b lines properly what you need to be able to do is decrease your frequency so that you can get more depth and you'll be able to see these b lines and then you'll see a double lung point so in essence i mean when you look at these lungs what do you think is wrong well, why does the baby have respiratory distress ttn okay very good yeah so again this is just l3 and can you see a classical c show now this is this is where i'd mm-hmm. i'd like to differentiate the previous slide from this slide so can you see absolutely no barcodes correct is everybody happy there are absolutely no barcodes over here 
Yes. 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 Okay. Right. Okay. Now we're going to just go back to the previous one. Can you see how there's a difference over here? Mm -hmm. This is not clear cut seashore. You have barcodes as well. Mm -hmm. And my gut feeling is next time, you know, maybe I should put them side by side, but I'm just comparing them. Do you see a long point in the, in the moon? You do. You do. And my gut feeling is it's over here. Okay. So this is basically a barcode that you see that's coming through. And this is a seashore sign. So that's the barcode. Mm -hmm. And this is the seashore. Excellent. Yeah. So I think what I'm trying to say to you is it can be very subtle. And really, in this baby, you know, what we think is the real problem is actually transient acute newborn. The baby is actually just uh, having delayed clearance of lung fluid. But uh, really, it's really important from your perspective. And again, just, you know, this is the L3 region. Just going to play it again so that you can actually see it better. So you can see again. So a very poor depth. Uh, so I've gone all the way to six, but what I haven't done in this particular image is really, yeah. So again, so small mistakes that you make, which can optimize your image. But if you look at this lung sliding in all the regions that you see over here, I'm just going to go back, play it again. So again, you can see the comet tails moving, good plural sliding. And when you play this slide, again, you see a classical seashore sign. Let me just see if I can play that image. No, it's it's an RV one. I haven't been able to save that. Okay. So these are the images side by side now. Now, can you see the difference? Yes. Can you see why I'm making a diagnosis of a right anterior pneumothorax? Mm, yes. This is a classical seashore sign. But actually, mm -hmm. what you've got is you've got a lung point here with a barcode appearing. This is seashore sign. And then you have a barcode appearing over here. Can you see the difference? Yes. And that's how subtle it can be. And that's why it's very important for you to do all your lung regions anteriorly. With any baby who has respiratory distress in the, 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 the first, I'd say, few hours of life, you know, keep all differentials in mind. But, you know... The, the reason you want to know this is what if this baby suddenly deteriorates in a few hours? Now, inevitably, uh, we will continue doing x-rays, but you know, our French colleagues knowing this would obviously suspect and do a quick lung ultrasound to see if that pocket of air has actually increased in size. Any questions? Thank you. So small pneumothorax, no action, baby got better. Okay, so now we're going to look at a few more slides. So this is a preterm 31 weeker. And uh, what you're looking at is the right. So these are the R1s. Okay. Uh, this is, no, this is R2. These are three R1s. Why do I have three R1s? So who should we ask? Dr. Hassoun. Why do I have three R1s? Okay, Dr. Soon might not be able to hear us, but uh, who else can I ask? Uh, Dr. Rana, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, so Dr. Rana, I've got quite a few R1s. I'm trigger happy today. Why do you think I have three R1s? Uh, I don't know if you've tried to cover, I mean, I've not looked carefully at each one of them, but whether you've done them at different times in the course of this baby's disease. Okay, fair point. I mean, that's a really good kind of uh, analogy. So if you I look at my- I trying to optimize the image. Okay, that's one thing. I mean, what I'd say is all these images are rubbish. That's why I'm sharing them with you. You know, it's important that we share our rubbish with you as well. But really... The lower one, uh, uh, does it show double lung point? Towards the lower okay, side? So, so can I just say, guys, this is, this is exactly what 
uh, we we want to kind of avoid. So let's we're going to go structurally. We're going to go step by step, exactly following the protocol that we did. So what we're going to do is I'm going to nominate. Uh, so we, we we've got Dr. Rana and uh, we've got Dr. Young. So Dr. Young and Dr. Rana are uh, our team. So you've basically got a preterm 31 week in the first 24 hours of life. Uh, antenatal steroids were not received. Uh, the baby basically, based on clinical work of breathing and a respiratory acidosis, ended up having a laser procedure at about 12 hours. And uh, post the laser procedure after kind of two hours, we, we, we've got a baby who's rapidly going up. FiO2 has gone up to 60, 70%. The SATs are barely holding 88 to 90. And auscultation basically on the right side, when we, we listen, we have reduced air entry with significant recession. Okay, so, so you want me to interpret these scans, yeah? I'd be really grateful. <laughs> okay, we'll try. So uh, on R one, the on the right top corner or the left top corner, uh, we can see uh, the image has stopped now. It's not moving at all. Okay, uh, are they not moving for everybody? Now they are. Okay, lovely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I can see, uh, I think the the depth is about, is it about four centimeters? It's, it's not three. Uh, it's about three centimeters. Three centimeters. So one, yeah. yeah, for a 31-weeker. So it could be four. I agree. Yep. Yeah, so it's about three centimeters. Yeah. Uh, it can see two intercostal spaces, three ribs. Three ribs. Yeah. I can see uh, the pleura is sliding and looks to be continuous. Um, it's not as sharp as it should be. Yeah. Um, I can see some A lines. Very nice. Um, few B lines, I think, but many okay. B lines. Okay. Okay, great. That's lovely. So, so if we just go, so Pura, you thought was irregular. Yeah, it looks regular. a little bit thickened. It looks thickened. Okay, so it's thickened. But do you think it's regular? Uh, it's regular, but it does look a little bit thickened. Don't know. Beautiful. Okay, that's beautiful. I completely agree with that. So you've got a batwing sign. You've got two ribs. You've got the 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 pleura in between. So I've got two batwing signs there. I've got pleura that you're correctly identifying as thick. Uh, I, I, do we think, so just where my cursor is, do you think they're sliding there? Um, I think there is sliding. Okay, fair point. Fair I can point. see some comet tails coming and going, just a couple of them, very small. So those ones? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. fair point. And then you've got A lines. Uh, do you see any B lines? They don't look it's like okay. They the normal B lines we have seen. Yep. Yep. Fair point. Completely fair point. Okay. So that's great. Now we're gonna get Jean. What do we think? Well, I think it's not a typical picture of what you you'd expect in a baby with RDS. Um, so I think the R one images look quite different to each other, which is quite concerning. Um, in the top left-hand corner, I don't really think there's convincing sliding, um, and I can't really see any B lines, although you can see quite a nice A profile. Um, in the subsequent R1 images, um, the plural line looks very irregular. Um, the, the A lines don't look very typical as well, and I wonder if there's some shred sign there as well. Um, in, in the middle R1 picture, you can see A lines, um, but it all looks very irregular and there are pockets of increased echogenicity there, which could represent, um, you know, fluid or... Okay. Yeah, I, or yeah. something else. So basically what both of you have said is, Dr. Sharma, your images are shit, <laughs> which I completely accept. Uh, so 
I I would agree. I I, I agree with Gene. I, I really worry about that plural line uh, over there and whether you're really sliding. I, I think at the moment, I'm, I'm certainly not sliding. And this is what you kind of should be seeing in terms of the shimmering. I can see a baby that's breathing. And clearly the reason I'm struggling at this particular point is I'm actually using the hockey stick. So I'm getting a very small footprint. Uh, not only am I using the hockey stick with a very small footprint, I've got my gain settings turned up big time. So, you know, my, my dynamic gain at this particular point is about, it's, it's, it's really high. And for that reason, basically what is happening is it's exaggerating everything. Uh, the ribs, uh, you can actually see that the acoustic shadow behind the ribs is actually looking bright. And uh, what I'd say is that classically, what you really need to do is you need to optimize your settings. Otherwise, it can make it very difficult for you to interpret. But what I'd say is that what you're seeing here as breakdown is actually, these are mirror image ribs. So that's the rib. This is a mirror image rib. That's the rib. This is a mirror image rib. And your pleura is not sliding. Uh, and it's not sliding over there either. So you do an M mode on this. And uh, again, this is just the R1 images. So a little bit more clear with the hockey stick at this particular point. So this is the R1 and it's a little bit more typical. So can you see how there's no, there's absolutely no plural sliding at this particular point? And, and I agree, it's quite difficult to interpret if you only have one and a half ribs. That yeah. you, you know, it's yeah. and that's what I'd say that you know, when you're kind of using the hockey stick in that situation, sometimes it can be really challenging. But as soon as you start using a linear probe that actually uh, uses uh, a frequency, and I'm using uh, a frequency that's much higher at this particular point, can you see how the image changes? So, would you like to interpret that, Doctor Rana? Yeah, that definitely is a better quality, looks better. <laughs> uh, so we can see batwing signs. Uh, we can see the uh, plura. Uh, I'm not, yeah, you can see uh, A-lines um, throughout. Yeah. Um, and here, I really can't see the lung sliding. Absolutely. And I think sometimes, you know, and I'm going to be really honest with you, we all go through a learning phase and so did I. You need to be humble enough to accept that. Uh, but I mean, clearly from our perspective, what stands out is this is R1. There's no sliding. You've got an A profile. Uh, take my word for it. When I when when you put the M mode on, there was a barcode sign over here. So this is R1 for you. And then you go all the way up to R3 with so many rib spaces. So how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, you're really moving all the way from R1 to R3 with absolutely no sliding. So anybody, do we, what, what kind of an omothorax do we think this is, small or large? I think it's large. large. Yeah, it's a large omothorax. And I mean, this was a baby who, you know, stable enough because we had saturations that weren't crashing, the heart rate was okay for us to rapidly needle this baby. Uh, we did not do and wait for a chest X-ray in this particular situation. Uh, so again, it's just to give you an idea that you can actually quantify your pneumothorax. And again, just for those of you who can see me, can you see me? No. Okay, you can't see me. My apologies. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Can, can see. Okay. So basically, when I start, whenever I start looking for a pneumothorax, my protocol is quite simple. If I think there's an acute deterioration, I will I will examine time permitting first. Try to clinically correlate. Well, where is the air entry reduced? Now, I can't emphasize this enough for you. So when you have right-sided pneumothoraces, mediastinal shift will be towards the left. Your heart sounds will be better heard on the left. It's really important in the smallest babies, you know, auscultating, you know, air entry is so squeaky. The difference between the intensity of the sounds can be quite difficult. But actually hearing good heart sounds on the left, translumination on the right, uh, will give you your diagnosis. But when you have a left-sided pneumothorax, mediastinal shift is here. Experience says that the things that really stand out to me is I often can't hear the heart sounds uh, because the heart has been moved. But just a simple, quick examination will kind of say that this is my area of interest. Now, if you're doing an ultrasound, you want to start with the area of interest. So I think if it's left-sided and I'm more worried, I will start with the left side first. But a centimeter 
parallel to the mid sternal line i'm going to do r1 r2 very quickly with their m modes at the same time so you know we don't want to waste time over here so r1 m r2 m mode so r3 m mode r4 m mode now really because air is going to rise anteriorly what i would then do is obviously if i can see and i make a diagnosis that i worry is a pneumothorax on that right side because it's clinically the case then i will gradually move my cursor around basically trying to locate the lung point to see how large this pneumothorax is and that basically from my perspective will help quantify whether i've got you know if, if i'm going to r3 and i've got this kind of sign that's a pretty decent pretty large pneumothorax there are some situations in which you might not be able to see a lung point no this is the classical barcode sign that you can see this is my lung point so this is seashore that you see over here and you have a barcode sign coming up here and this is basically the classical area where you see the lung point in this in this image in r3 it's very lateral now let's let's show you what it looks like so just very quickly let me show you that again So can you see the lung point, everybody? Yeah. See that? That's how subtle it can be. So you can see what is basically from our perspective, a pneumothorax, no sliding. And can you see the difference in image quality? So what I'd say to you is that, you know, using a hockey stick with an improper frequency, you can't see any brutal sliding. You see an A profile at this particular point. Obviously, frequency can drop. A little bit to get a little bit more depth, but I'm focusing. My focus is at the level of the pleura, and the reason is I, I really want to see the lung point. You can see a really nice lung point, and this is how it's visible when you actually look at the barcode sign. So, so I, you, I have a question. Sorry, yeah. where's where's the fourth to fifth intercostal space on this picture? So, where would you put the needle? So, so what I'd say to you at this particular point is my needle would go anatomically in the second intercostal space in mid clavicular line. For a for needle thoracus. No, yeah, because nomothorax air is anterior. So you're not, this is I, not a pleural effusion. You didn't put a chest strain in, you put a... So for, for me, what I'd say is it depends on clinical presentation. You know, if the baby's crashing and burning, I would needle thoracentesis first while I'm preparing for a chest strain because yeah. that's quicker. Yeah. So, you know, for me, that would be the better option. But just don't get confused between a pleural effusion and a pneumothorax and trying to use an ultrasound to try and determine your standard definition for needle thoracentesis is second intercostal space, mid clavicular line. You're going to go in, hold your needle there uh, with a three way tap and aspirate as much as you can, uh, or put it underwater, you know, in a small beaker full of water to let it bubble away. But clearly what you can see over here is a lung point and how subtle it can be. And, you know, again, what you can see is the lung point seashore going into barcode. So assuming you've done a needle thoracocentesis and the, yeah. the air leak is still there when you repeat the ultrasound. Yeah. Uh, I mean, clinically... Your bad part shouldn't be near the lung point. Is that right? So what I'd say is that what you might find is that you can see pleural sliding uh, in the R3 region. And actually, what you might be left with is a small pocket of air. Uh, I and there wouldn't be any point in draining that anyways. No, because you're going to move clinically. And hopefully, clinically, your baby is much better. So, I mean, for this baby, once we, we needle this baby, I mean, this baby basically, from our perspective, uh, didn't even need a tube. So, we, we managed on CPAP. Once we needled the saturation, heart rate, everything picked up. And actually, clinically, the baby was cardiovascularly stable. So it was a decent size 31 weeker. But again, it's to say to you that you'll see improvements and you'll be able to see sliding maybe all the way through, but you might still be left with an anterior pocket of air. And I will be showing you a case soon where we've done exactly that. You know, you've done serial ultrasounds over days because it's actually taken up to 36 hours for the baby to kind of completely get better. Any other questions? Okay. So basically what we had was a large pneumothorax needled. My apologies. I think we did do a chest strain on this baby. So, yeah. Uh, so pneumothorax wise, can I just say that we call it A-dash profile. It's absent lung sliding, demonstration of A lines with no B lines, a barcode sign 
and then you must look for the lung point. Now, this is classically what the lung point looks like. So you can see sliding. Now, just again, what I'd like to say to you is that if, if, if you're confused about lung sliding in a particular slide, so you can see lung sliding over here. Don't hesitate to magnify or go or zoom into that area just to kind of focus on the pleural line. So actually I've zoomed in in this image and it just makes the pleura so much more visible. And that's exactly what you see over here. This is a zoomed in image. So you can see pleural sliding on the left where I'll just show you with the laser pointer. That's pleural sliding. There's no pleural sliding. So it's very clearly obvious. But what it's basically telling you is that there is an area of normal lung with visceral and parietal pleura sliding over each other and an area of lung that obviously has air in it. Now, what is the lung point basically representing when you do an ultrasound? So it's basically representing the area where the lung is expanding with the visceral and the parietal pleura coming into contact. So you can see it very nicely in this image over here. Now, the pneumothorax, and this is the air collection. Now, if it's massive, and if the lung collapses to just a nubbin, because you have a tension pneumothorax, you might not be able to find a lung point. Now, experience says that those babies are usually very symptomatic. And I think if you're coming to the point of needing to do an ultrasound on a baby to make that diagnosis, my gut feeling is it's a clinical diagnosis. It's one that we, sh we should have made clinically. So, you know, I think if you've come to that point, just be very careful. So the situation in which I've seen that happen is, you have a pneumothorax that's very rapidly increasing in size. So you're doing the ultrasound, you saw the lung point, it's a bronchopleural fistula or it's popped. And basically you've suddenly developed into a tension pneumothorax. You've lost your lung point completely. And really the baby is clinically deteriorating. When you're doing a lung ultrasound in situations like this, as Nadia will talk to you about when we're using the SAFER or the SAFER R protocol, please have somebody looking at the baby and keeping an eye on the observations. Please make sure that they're able to interrupt you if they find that the baby actually needs resuscitation or we need clinical management as opposed to you doing your ultrasound. And be aware of the weight of the ultrasound, you know, your hand, all of those things in an extremely small baby and the impact of that. It's really, really important. But again, what you, you really want to do is make sure that you can see the lung point. And this is a classical example where you've got no lung point. So you have a large pneumothorax, the lung is completely collapsed, and really what you do is you trace from right, right up to, or left, right up to the posterior axillary line, and you see absolutely no sliding. And this is classical. So you see no sliding over here with a classical truck sign, A lines, no B lines. So the M mode sign we've already talked about. This is what a classical barcode sign looks like. But again, it's just to highlight to you that these changes can be very subtle and very easily missed. So, you know, sometimes it's very subtle what you actually see on the, the actual image. You can see over here. <clears throat> so can you see how subtle it is? So the reason I'm showing you this image is, can, can everybody see the lung point? Yes. Yes. That's the lung point there. So can you see how easy it is to miss a lung point? in this particular situation. And really what you need to do in this situation is you need to go laterally and you'll be able to see the lung point better. So now you can see the lung point much better. But even here, when you actually look at the images, you can see the seashore sign subtly becoming a barcode sign. It's not as clear. And the reason for that is because newer machines tend to filter out the, the artifact over here are basically done on older machines where the artifact is filtered out less. And in adults, they tend to use curvilinear probes with lower frequencies, which give more depth. They, they tend to give better barcode signs. So just, just be cautious when you're actually doing them. This is just what a barcode sign looks like. So next case, I'm really basically coming to the end of the session. So who would like to have a go at this? Anybody want to volunteer? Yes, yeah. look, if you want. Okay, go for it. Uh, so uh, we've got a term baby. This baby was born uh, in a setting of uh, mycorium. So there was, there was an ARM done about six hours back and very thick mycorium was actually found. 
And with that thick meconium, uh, the baby uh, had slightly decreased fetal movements as well. So eventually this baby ended up having a cesarean section once the CTG was done because there were concerns with regards to fetal tachycardia, all of this and fetal distress. The baby was born and actually had a good heart rate, but did not breathe and needed IPPV. He was quite, I would say, uh, depressed with poor respiratory effort. And after about 12 to 13 minutes of IPPV, you know, the baby was basically intubated and ventilated. There was very thick meconium staining off the cord, the nails, the skin. So, you know, very clearly this baby had been in contact with meconium for, you know, a good day. Uh, and these are the lung ultrasound findings. So these are the lung ultrasound findings. So who wants to have a go at them? Uh... I will start to comment. Yes, go for it. Okay. So we start with uh, R1. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we have uh, plural sliding. The plural look for me irregular. Okay. Uh, uh, some sub plural consolidation and coalescent V line. No, uh, no A line seen. So mainly B profile with irregular plural and some sub plural consolidation. Okay, fair point. What do we think? So I just, what, what is this? So uh, this is, gonna, S what do we think that is? Well, the plura is not seen there. Maybe it's at the lecture, this? Yes. Or okay, consolidation. Uh, somebody said something. Who said that? Is it thymus? It's thymus, Lela. You're right. This is the thymus. So just, again, the reason for wanting to show you this slide, and we'll be talking a lot about collapse consolidation, in particular, the right upper lobe. So this is classically the thymus, and it gives you a tissue sign, which sometimes people worry looks like atelectasis because you can't see a plural line if you look at my cursor. But actually, this is thymus, and it also shows a lung pulse. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, another rubbish image from Dr. Sharma, as usual. So clearly, the plural looks a little bit irregular. Yeah. Suman, you want towards, to say something? Yes, yes. Towards the uh, extreme right in that same image. Yeah. Um, the plural looks a little uh, less sliding and there are V lines there. Very good. Uh, so is there a lung point there? Uh, no. So a lung point, uh, Suman is seen only when you see a pneumothorax. I mean, double double lung. lung point. Okay, that's fine. So just guys, be very careful of the connotations you're using. Double lung point is used in the context of kind of sharp interface. Okay, so what, what I'd say is you've got plura that looks very irregular. Now, some of that is obviously because the alignment of the probe is not great. So you can see how the ribs kind of slide down a little bit. So you probably want to correct your alignment. Now, the way to correct your alignment when you're in the right side and if you're struggling and I'm using a linear probe uh, is to kind of direct the linear probe a little bit more, have better contact. But if you want, just put a shoulder roll under the baby and a shoulder roll will basically... Uh, help basically uh, delineate this area much better. Uh, I'd probably agree with you that, you know, this is a very dense Corley's beeline that you see over here. And I do think at this particular point that the plura, even with the nature of my image, that there's an element of subplural consolidation that you can see. Uh, so, okay, really good. What about R2? Uh, R2 is also, as we have, here we can say on the uh, left side, the plura is irregular. Yeah. After that, it's regular, good sliding, not well sliding, but there is sliding. Yeah. There is uh, many comet tails and some B line. Uh, Very good. And this A line, I think, in between. Excellent. So beautiful. Uh, anything else you'd like to comment upon? So what do you think? So my gain is only 38%. So my, my view is the gain can be much better in these images and the gain can be much higher. And I promise you, I will show you the good images I've taken as well. Yeah. But I think, you know, 38% should probably go up to about 68, 70. The other thing is I'm using medium resolution. You know, again, the slight worry that I have at this particular point is this is a term baby and I'm using a high frequency. And because I'm using a high frequency probe, 
I'm kind of in a situation where the superficial part of the lung is nicely visible, but the deep part of the lung is completely going. My depth is pretty okay. It's four centimeters. So again, image optimization, just small tips at being able to use that. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I kind of, from my perspective at this particular point, need to try and get slightly better images. And again, this is just the lower part of R2. And it's just an example, again, that I'd like to kind of show you. So I've just changed the frequency here so that I can actually see the deeper part of the lung. So I can't see the deeper part of the lung in this slide. So I've just changed my frequency and I can see deeper part of the lung. And oh, would you like to critique this one? So this is the good R2. Yep. Um, also, here's the plura is sliding regular. Yep. And the uh, B line. Okay. Uh, so it's a B profile. So, yeah. but what do you think? Any subplural consolidations? <sighs> Go with your gut. Absolutely fine. Maybe, maybe in the left side of the pictures, there is some. Yep. And again, that's the reason for showing you the picture that altering frequency. I mean, I'm not convinced we have any subplural consolidations. And my gut feeling is when you see this image, I don't think these are subplural consolidations either. So uh, I, I think that's where you have to be very careful. But what you can classically see when you see this image is you've got B lines going all the way down. This is a rib shadow, a, a big acoustic shadow, but these are actually A lines. So there is an element of aeration in R2 in the lower low. Yeah. So again, uh, as you can see, this is what I would call a, a double lung point. And this is just a very good example, maybe with meconium aspiration. So they can have double lung points as well. And this is just another example for you to kind of say that a double lung point is not pathognomonic of TTN. And if anybody is telling you that, then, then they're, not, they're not correct. I think that concept, you know, Corsini's article that was published in 2012 has long been superseded. We see double lung points in a lot of other fields. But here you can see Coley's B lines. So what you've got is you've got a B profile, R1, B profile, R2. You do probably have a regular plura, you know, in R1 at this particular point. And I would probably agree. I, I just worry, you know, is that an element of consolidation there? Because the Pura is pretty, uh, you know, decently uh, irregular. So just wonder whether there's a consolidation there as opposed to a Coley's B line. But uh, let's look at the left side. Okay, this is right lateral. So anybody want to comment? So go for it. Uh, okay. So um, this is the right lateral. Yep. Would you like to comment on whether this is longitudinal or transverse? Well, it doesn't seem it's uh, longi longitudinal. It's transverse, most probably. Why? There is no bad sign. Very good. That's beautiful. So basically what you're looking at is a, a longitudinal, uh, sorry, a transverse view. I'm looking at one space. Now, the reason I want to show you this is... Uh, uh, Okay, let, let's let you describe it first. Go for it. Yep. Um, here's the plura is sliding. Yep. Uh, I think it's regular. Also, as the left side of the image, or right side, maybe regular. And yep. the B profile for sure. I don't yep. see any A line. Yep. And yep. in the right side of the picture, I don't know if this consolidation just below the. Yes, yes, this one. Okay. I, I would probably agree with you. That looks like a consolidation to me at this particular point. And uh, it's definitely below the level of the plura. It's subplural in its nature. Uh, again, a very dense profile over here uh, with B lines that go all the way down, a complete B profile, but a B profile with what I'd call is patchy consolidation. So, you okay. know, there's a patch of consolidation over here. I think if we... In kind of decreased our frequency, you might find that you also pick up a, a patch of consolidation over here, but definitely a consolidation over here. Any Anybody want to come in? Any any other comments? Uh, can I ask, I, I thought initially it's like, uh, it looks like bright as a uh, air bronchogram initially, okay. so, but the pattern looks different. I agree. It looks more consolidation when I look. So what I'd say to you is that consolidations can have air bronchograms in them, but they're not as bright. You know, if you remember how I showed you that they're very bright when you see them. So my gut feeling is the plura is also irregular at this particular point. And so 
with a, a slight area that's that's dark at this particular point. So my gut feeling is I think that's an area of consolidation at this particular point. I'm not entirely sure that's uh, that that is uh, air bronchogram. But again, what I'd say is this is just a consolidation in one space. And actually, if you do more spaces, and this is just in the right inferior. So what do we oh, think oh, over here? I, I, I'm yep. sorry. Can Please you come ahead. back? Um, if the left screen is uh, transverse, why do we see acoustic shadows of the ribs? I'm a bit so, confused. So what I'd say, actually, from my perspective is it's probably because even when, so for any baby, when you're, when you're looking at a transverse view, your probe might not be exactly parallel. You might be hitting or, you know, the ribs might be very close together. So you will sometimes get shadows there. Okay. So I wouldn't be, you know, I think what I'd say is, again, it also depends on the probe that you're using. Like if you're using a big linear probe, which has a wide footprint, you might find that actually the, the intercostal space is so close together that especially in the extremely preterm babies, you know, when you do it, it can be extremely challenging. So, yeah. But I, I think it's a good question. What about over here? What do we think? That's right inferior. Um, yeah. Also, uh, look, there is there's a plural is sliding here. Yeah. There is uh, from uh, this uh, photo, the left, right side from this photo, the, the plural a little bit irregular with maybe some pl plural consolidation and yep. a lot of B line. Yeah, so I would I would agree. You know, it's a B profile completely. You can't see anything A. And, you know, there's these areas where I think there is subplural consolidation at this particular point. And again, you know, you, you have a very patchy kind of B consolidation at this point with, so, I mean, if you just go back, it's it's virtually a whole B profile. But when we look and we describe Findings in kind of meconium aspiration. Again, you know, the mother of lung ultrasound, Dr. Yusuf, uh, will basically talk about a B pattern. So kind of patchy kind of interstitial pattern with consolidations, maybe areas of atelectasis, and you can find bronchograms. So what it is, is that when you look at different areas, you will find all these appearances in varying kind of amounts, you know, so kind of a clinical picture. So. Sorry, if I go on to the slide. It's the same maybe on the left side. So again, what you can see is irregular pleura with a predominantly B profile throughout L2. So heart coming in the way. This is where I'm getting L1. But a complete B profile with B lines going all the way down with pleura that looks pretty thick. And what do we think that is, guys? So let's. let's look at it. There is deep consolidation on the left side. Yep. And you've got, this is where I'd say that you might well have some bronchogram as well. It's this tissue sign. So there is a consolidation and you've got some bronchogram over there. So again, patchy consolidation L2 area with a predominantly B profile. Just trying to see if I can actually show it to you a little bit better. I don't know why it's not working today. And I suspect the reason is because each time you use the laser pointer, you can't see it. But can you see that? This is the left region. So that's a consolidation. And again, using a good frequency, you can get good depth at this particular point, but a B profile with consolidation on that L2 region. And the heart actually coming in the way at this particular point, but even here you have a, a B profile. I look, just one yeah. question about this consolidation what, that we see it on, on uh, many, many um, uh, views. We can uh, put the Doppler to see the vascularity. If yep, in absolutely, yep. okay. you can do, you can do. I, I think it's absolutely, and again, the question from my perspective is really, if I'm thinking meconium aspiration in this situation as opposed to pneumonia, 
I would want to differentiate and putting a Doppler on it would be absolutely fine to kind of see whether there's vascularity or not. But it's a really nice, deep consolidation. We talk about subcleural consolidations. And if you look at the previous images, you know, in this baby, and this is the right side that you see at this particular point. So again, you know, what you're seeing is dominant B profile with what is a subplural consolidation over here. Again, this to me looks like maybe a small area of atelectasis. The pleura is completely absent in this area, so no aeration. But when I go to the next image, actually what I'm seeing at this particular point is really a deep consolidation with air bronchograms well within it, maybe a few A lines at the bottom. So differential aeration. But what you get is a classical patchy appearance. And this is, you know, the classical x-ray appearance. You go to different regions and that is basically atelectasis for you, a B profile. Again, this is atelectasis with some static air bronchograms because they're not moving. You can even get a fractal sign. And uh, a fractal sign usually indicates that you've had significant lung degeneration to the point where you uh, you have problems with uh, uh, what probably is on lung disease that's been there for a while. So I would I would strongly emphasize that what is really important, my take home message from today's session is that your history and clinical presentation and clinical correlation are very important. But what is important is that you first interrogate the lung ultrasound in a structured way. So you're looking for the bat sign, you're looking for pleura, you're describing it, you're looking for sliding, then you're looking for deeper structures, you're trying to classify a profile, with the profile, what you're trying to do is then clinically correlate by looking at every region. Depending on your clinical findings, you have to decide, you know, M mode, every region, if you think there's a pneumothorax. I, I think, you know, clinically, I wouldn't necessarily do M mode in every region uh, if I can see lung sliding. And I, I clearly think this baby has got a different pathology. Really, what I'm trying to garner with an M mode is, again, looking for a specific sign, sinusoidal sign or trying to look for a lung point. So, you know, that's where I would say you have to kind of uh, tailor your, your lung ultrasound to what is happening. But at the end of the day, you have to clinically correlate and make your diagnosis. So any questions? Any uh, questions? In your yeah. scans, the, the focus was low. It was on yeah. purpose? Yeah, because I'm looking at the deeper part of the lung because okay. I want to look for consolidation. So unless I keep the focus low, my margin, my plural margin is where the focus will be. And I'm not going to get a very nice tissue sign. Can you see what a nice tissue sign this is? So with the, the you know, so I've, I've kept the marker at that level. Again, what I'm trying to do at this particular point is interrogate for consolidations, because this is a baby who I, I think clinically has got, has got uh, meconium aspiration. And really, I can see the sliding in the pleura anyway, even with that. But if you, yes. you know, the perfect perfectionist amongst us, I, I would not worry from my perspective if you, you had the plura there, the, the sorry, the, the focus at the level of the plura and then brought it down when you wanted to see the consolidation. But by keeping okay. my focus at that level, I, I mean, also just for your knowledge, guys, I've taken about 35 images on this baby, but what I'm showing you is actually just a handful. And so, you know, there are images where I've looked at the plura with the focus at that margin, but really to optimize this image to show you the consolidation, I've got my focus at the appropriate level. I don't know why it does that on my, my, my Zoom presentations. It just goes into X-ray mode and then comes through. Any other questions? Just a quick uh, question. Yeah. About meconium aspiration, um, we know that B lines and different other conditions may um, indicate clinically that you need to uh, have an action like increasing the pressure on the ventilator. But in particular, so in the particular situation of meconium aspiration, uh, does the predominance of B line does it affect your clinical decision in terms of uh, ventilation strategies. I mean, at this point, probably uh, you'll be thinking of oscillation or uh, even nitric if there is a PPHN creeping in. 
in the picture. So what is the implication of lung ultrasound in meconium aspiration? So what I'd say is that really lung recruitment reflects the ability to be able to recruit lung that is either consolidated or atelectatic. The B profile and interstitial pattern of lungs is because of fluid in the interlobular and intralobular spaces. Now, theoretically, from our perspective, there is a process, maybe mechanical and kind of obstruction of meconium that's interfering with the absorption of that fluid. So for me, the actual B profile on its own is not a marker of lung recruitment. I would say that if I'm looking at a baby with meconium aspiration in particular, I'm clinically correlating. And a very good example that I'd give you is that if I'm using too much pressure and I've got a dense A profile with absolutely no consolidation, I might be decreasing venous return. So I will be doing functional echo at the same time to kind of look at the heart. So it's the heart-lung interaction, which Nadia will cover. But just looking at a B profile and saying that this is a B profile, so my lung's not recruited. If I'm not on much pressure and my CO2 clearance is okay and my FiO2 is not high, it would mean nothing to me. But a good example is if I'm kind of in the situation where I have uh, a B profile with significant consolidation uh, of maybe a lobe of the lung or the right or the left lungs, and I'm in a situation where I want to think of a recruitment maneuver, I put my map up by a certain degree, which is usually the peak inspiratory pressure. And then I repeat the ultrasound after a while to kind of see whether I've been able to recruit those areas of consolidation. The B profile in the fluid might still not be absorbed. So you might still have a B profile, but that area of atelectasis or consolidation might have been recruited. So in isolation, I would, I would not regard the B profile as helpful in my ventilation strategies. What I would say is that if you see and do serial lung ultrasounds and your B profile is getting better and you're getting more aeration, Hopefully that's an indicator to you that the interstitial fluid, that interstitial edema that's there, which is probably there because something has interfered, an inflammatory chemical inflammation has interfered with lung fluid absorption uh, is now getting better. That's the way I'd put it. Any other questions? Would you increase the PIP or the PWP? Okay. Uh, so. Uh, it depends on, again, what I'm starting out with and what the baby is like clinically. So the risk of putting the PEEP up too much is you reduce your venous return even more. So I think individual baby, individual circumstances, what the x-ray looks like. And again, what I'd say to you is I wouldn't rely on lung ultrasound alone. I'm not, I'm not that good at the moment. I, I am going to be very humble. And I'm going to acknowledge that uh, using lung ultrasound as a recruitment maneuver while a baby's on CPAP, yes, I, I don't have any problems with that. But I think once I start getting a baby onto the ventilator, I really want to make sure I've got lung recruited. Uh, I, I, I would still be getting x-rays done at this stage. I'm just not good enough. I'm not as good as Nadia or, or Almedina for that matter. Just one question. So what do you say if the colleagues say, if you have a patchy appearance on x-ray, why do you need a long ultrasound now? Okay, so fair point. I have no problems with that argument. Uh, what I would say to them at this particular point is that, look, at the moment, we're all learning. We, we from our perspective, are at the stage where we need to pattern recognize because there are clearly areas that we know have high quality evidence in terms of management, RDS, you know, and I, I, I don't know if you guys have been on the Twitter debate that's raging on Twitter at the moment with the, our guys across in America. But clearly there is, I would say, reasonable quality evidence for management of RDS, for differentiation of RDS and TTN, which has management implications. I think the argument that the diagnosis of meconium aspiration by lung ultrasound in itself may not necessarily alter management, I think is correct. But that is now. We don't know that will be the case in the future. Uh, there'll be more research. And I think that's where while you're learning and being able to clinical correlate, it gets better with time. I'm going to be really honest with you to the point where even if you're not doing beautiful, crisp, fantastic, lovely ultrasounds, you can make diagnosis. That is important. So, you know, I, I, I want to say to you, and that's where I would like to say to the people who don't have a linear probe, don't worry about it. Because actually, you can still make a diagnosis of an with a with a 
a shit scanner like this because actually for me i i can i i can't at this stage in this image see any lung sliding i can see an a profile with no b lines and if i put an m mode on i'll get a barcode sign so i know there's no mutrax there so again i I'd, i'd say to you don't hesitate to learn don't hesitate i mean i i i i i i'm absolutely not using lung ultrasound for the diagnosis of bpd but that's why we've got almedina here she's going to teach us you know i i'm not using it for diaphragmatic contractility but that's why we've got experts there to kind of show us how to do it because at some point like functional echo was years back you know uh, i i think functional lung ultrasound will also progress because i face a lot of resistance and what is said is we have an x ray what's the indication for lung ultrasound <laughs> take it in your stride take it in your stride respect that view you know i i think the way i do it i i respect that view and uh, what what you've got to do is you've got to kind of uh, prove it with the evidence the articles you know are all there uh, again what i'd say is that there are people who will still continue not to believe and that's that's fair that's okay we respect that you know it's 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 okay to disagree on those particular points but i think you you have to see how it benefits you in 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 your work and if you feel it benefits you and certainly for certain conditions it does me then i will use it okay. i'm not going to try and convince everybody lovely i'm so grateful guys i'm going to let you go and grab some sleep uh god bless you and thank you for your patience thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you all